In April 2020, Karina Dietering of the Sedona Ranch Complex at Henderson Pass, USA, shot and killed her two children, a three-year-old boy and a five-year-old girl, as well as her mother. The internet is littered with news articles about mothers killing both their parents and children. The phenomenon seems to be no less common now than it was almost 36 years ago, when Sheila Caffell, an under-medicated schizophrenic, 26-year-old mother of two, took a hunting rifle and killed her parents and twin boys at White House Farm. Sheila Caffell's killings fit common characteristics of both altruistic and acutely psychotic murders presented by experts in the field such as Dr. Resnick in the USA. While these cases are far more common in the US than in the UK, there are many instances of mothers killing their children with or without firearms. The case of Sheila Caffell needs to be understood within the dearth of material of mental health care and support during the 1980s in Britain. In 1983, the UK Mental Health Act brought in stronger laws to trigger social changes which were already happening as a result of a government initiative to close mental asylums in favour of care in the community. These changes were largely positive, allowing individuals who would usually be institutionalised to live safely in the community. The former mental health hospitals were sold and the money was intended to benefit mental health services. In addition, pharmaceutical companies manufactured medications for individuals with serious mental illnesses, including schizophrenia, to live in the community. These drugs included the so-called major tranquilizers, which could medicate seriously mentally ill individuals, including schizophrenics. The transition from being institutionalised to living in the community enhanced the lives of many people. But there was a downside to this, as some patients who had no support networks, such as close family or friends, found themselves without safe places to go and ended up living on the streets. If they did not access regular health care, their condition would go untreated and often these individuals became a danger to themselves, at high risk of harm and suicide. To many, care in the community was a utopian solution. It was flawed because it did not provide adequate provision for patients to access local support from mental health professionals. Although Sheila Caffell was initially treated privately, she was transferred to NHS care, but then was let down by social services. Another contributing factor was the medical blunders which led to Sheila having no benefits from her essential medication at all and this left her seriously under-medicated. So in this podcast, we'll look at a further issue against this backdrop of the Mental Health Act and the government's flagship system of care in the community. If police had not changed the direction of the Bamba case from murder-suicide to five murders, then undoubtedly an inquiry would have been launched into the healthcare failings which allowed someone with serious psychosis to leave hospital and stay at a farmhouse where there was an arsenal of guns and parents with no idea that their daughter was afraid that she would murder her children. During 1985, because of the apparent success of care in the community, the authorities would have been highly reluctant to raise questions over the release of Sheila Caffell and other patients like her. But there were concerns at the time over treatment of those leaving mental health care. For example, Marjorie Wallace, the founder of SANE, the mental health charity, published a series of articles in the Times newspaper called The Forgotten Illness, which highlighted the institutional failings of the mental health care system for people with schizophrenia. The following case is another example 
of how other failings occurred involving someone who was a danger to others and who was allowed to leave hospital and went on to kill. We present parallels of the Kefal case with the 1988 Osman case because in both the perpetrators were under the care of consultant psychiatrist Dr Hugh Ferguson. The Osman assailant Paul Paget Lewis and schizophrenic Sheila Kefal both had serious mental health issues before they carried out the shootings in which people were murdered. The evidence from the Osman case in this podcast comes from the European Court of Human Rights, Osman versus the UK Judgment, from October 1998. It is contended by the Jeremy Bamber Innocence Campaign that if his defence lawyers had access to Sheila's medical records, written by Dr Ferguson, he would not have been convicted on a 10 to 2 majority verdict, but acquitted. This would have exposed Dr Ferguson to further questioning regarding Sheila's treatment for schizophrenia. In 1986, the headmaster of Homerton House School in Hackney noticed that one of his teaching staff, Paul Paget Lewis, had developed an unhealthy attachment to Ahmet Osman, a pupil at the school. Paget Lewis informed the headmaster that because of this attachment, he intended to leave the school and become a supply teacher. However, the deputy head, Mr Perkins, persuaded him to stay. Paget Lewis's obsession continued and Ahmet recalled the teacher asking him to come and see him in his classroom at lunchtimes for Ahmet to learn Turkish and that Paget Lewis had given him money and taken photographs of him. Paget Lewis was reported to the police because he was harassing Ahmet and his family. The police gave assurances both to Mr Osman and the school that they would protect the family. With worsening mental health, Paget Lewis began to follow a friend of Ahmet's, Leslie Green, because Ahmet spent a lot of time with his friend. Jealous of the boy's closeness, the teacher spread malicious gossip about the relationship and accused Leslie Green of being a sexual deviant. Paget Lewis had told Leslie Green that he would become very angry if anything happened to his relationship with Ahmet. As a result of his obsession with the child, on the 14th of April 1987, Paget Lewis changed his name by deed poll to Paul Ahmet Yildirim Osman. Tragically, on the 7th of March 1988, Mr Ali Osmond, Ahmet's father, was shot dead by Paget Lewis and Ahmet was also shot but survived. Paget Lewis then drove to the home of Mr Perkins, the deputy headmaster, where he shot and wounded Mr Perkins and killed his son. Prior to these events, on the 19th of May 1987, Paget Lewis was seen by Dr Hugh Ferguson, the Inner London Education Authority reported. This teacher must indeed give cause for concern. He does not present ill in formal terms, nor does he seem sexually deviant. He does have personality problems, and his judgment regarding his friendship with a pupil is reprehensibly suspect. Dr Ferguson recommended that Paget Lewis remain teaching at the school, but that he should receive some form of counselling and psychotherapy. The second examination of the teacher took place a few weeks later, in June 1987. Dr Ferguson now recorded that Paget Lewis was angry that he was no longer allowed to contact Ahmet and Ferguson concluded that under the circumstances he should be designated temporarily unfit to work. On the third meeting, two weeks later, Ferguson made additional recommendations. On the 16th of June 1987, following a further interview with Paget Lewis, Dr Ferguson recommended that he should no longer teach at Hummerton House and that transfer on medical grounds was strongly and urgently recommended. However, on viewing the full case file, Ferguson had stated that Paget Lewis was fit to teach and displayed no clear signs of mental illness which would have suggested that he posed a real and immediate danger to the lives of the Osmans. 
Following his three meetings with Paget Lewis, Ferguson stated he was satisfied he was not mentally ill. On the 28th of October 1988, Paget Lewis was convicted of two charges of manslaughter, having pleaded guilty on the grounds of, of diminished responsibility. He was sentenced to be detained in a secure mental hospital without limit, pursuant to Section 41 of the Mental Health Act 1983. The Osman and Perkins families complained that the police had failed in their duty of care and the European Court of Human Rights heard the case in 1998. The Osman and the Perkins families had in fact sought to sue Ferguson but subsequently abandoned their action against him, for which no reason was given. The European Court of Human Rights voted unanimously that there had been a breach of Article 6, Section 1, in that the police had failed in their duty of care to Ahmet and to the Osman family and were negligent in failing to protect the life of a child, given that police had assumed responsibility for the child's safety. £10,000 was awarded to Ahmet and an additional £10,000 was paid to his mother, while £30,000 in costs was also awarded. Sheila Kafel's parents, Neville and June Bamba, chose Dr Ferguson to treat Sheila as he had previously treated June Bamba for mental health issues. He first saw Sheila on the 2nd of August 1983 at St Andrew's Hospital in Northampton, and in his police statement, Ferguson said that Sheila was suffering from acute psychosis and had been depressed for about 18 months, which had led to an acute breakdown. He went on, During her treatment, I found that Sheila had bizarre delusions about possession by the devil and complex ideas about having sex with her twin sons. She thought her sons would seduce her and saw evil in both of them. In particular, she thought her son Nicholas was becoming a woman hater and was a potential murderer. She said she felt as if she was caught up in a coven of evil. In a police statement, Ferguson said that during March 1985, Sheila was readmitted urgently due to a deterioration of her mental state. And he went on to say that her behaviour was more disconnected than on her previous admittance to the hospital. He put her back onto the same medication as she'd had previously, but this time in the form of an injection. In his initial police statement, he said, I believe that Sheila would have relapsed into a state of acute psychosis, probably having a firmly held belief or delusion involving concepts of good and evil, and certainly paranoid, possibly involving her mother. Sheila is likely to have been in a disturbed, psychotic state at the time of the tragedy. However, after police sought to prosecute Jeremy Bamber for the killings of a family at White House Farm, Ferguson would later change his evidence, saying now that the medication she was on would have made her over-sedated. And as far as I'm concerned, I did not see Sheila as a violent person and certainly not as a patient who would have committed suicide. It appears that Ferguson was afraid that he may suffer a backlash about Sheila's care. And in a statement given on the 18th of September 1985, he attempted to diminish any responsibility that could have befallen him. Sheila was discharged on the 29th of March 1985. I was not happy about her leaving so soon and she felt she needed follow-up visits from a community psychiatric nurse. Dr Ferguson made it quite clear that he didn't feel Sheila should leave specialised hospital care. He could easily have prevented Sheila leaving St Andrew's Hospital or could have had her admitted to another psychiatric unit. He made no effort to organise an NHS community psychiatric nurse to visit her. Ferguson knew that Sheila was responsible for two young children and that she had expressed to him that she had a great deal of morbid thoughts. During the trial, Ferguson recalled Sheila's concerns about her care of the twins. She was at risk of having to have sex with them or to join with them in some violence and that she was capable of murdering them. 
Much like in the Osman case, which would follow just two years later, Dr Ferguson failed in his duty of care to Sheila and her family, releasing such a dangerous person back into the community without putting into place any suitable aftercare or help amounts to negligence. Dr Ferguson gave evidence to police that he arranged for Sheila's GP to administer her 200 milligram of haloperidol fortnightly by injection so that Sheila could not avoid taking it as prescribed. Dr Ferguson authorised the reduction in Sheila's medication and yet he failed to see her personally to reassess her condition, basing his decision to reduce the medication on Sheila's request, as her GP had informed him. In July 1985, though it was recommended her dose be reduced to 150 mg, she was given an even smaller amount of 100 mg in error by a GP who had not seen Sheila before, and the dose was changed to monthly, not fortnightly, as before. Therefore, in effect, Sheila was only given a quarter of the dose she'd had previously to control her schizophrenia and psychotic episodes. Drug screening tests were conducted on samples of Sheila's blood taken during the post-mortem examination, and the results showed only a trace of the antipsychotic medication was present. Dr Ferguson was not called by the prosecution to give evidence at Jeremy Bamber's trial, and so the defence were left with no option but to call him as a defence witness. However, because of this, the questions Dr Ferguson could be asked could only be based on the disclosed witness statements he'd made to the police. Dr Ferguson was extremely reluctant to give evidence. A summons had to be issued against him. Later, when Kingsley Napley, Jeremy's solicitor, contacted Dr Ferguson to inform him of the expected date he would have to attend court, it was recorded in a memo dated the 3rd of October 1986 that he was more than a little put out to say the least. The legal memo continued, spent ten minutes listening to his complaints and making profuse apologies to him, but explaining this is the way it is with trials and that we were doing all we could to give him something more definite. And that he was extremely distressed at the thought of not being able to go on holiday. But on the 20th of October 1986, this reluctant witness finally gave his evidence at trial. In all likelihood, Ferguson did not want to face questions about his poor handling of Sheila's mental health care. In both cases, Dr Ferguson had ample opportunity to protect children, their families and the public from two patients who had very serious mental health problems. On at least two occasions, both in May and June of 1987, after examining Paul Paget Lewis, despite Ferguson's serious concerns about his ability to cope in his job and in society, Ferguson made recommendations that Paget Lewis return to his job teaching children. Similarly, in the care of Sheila Caffell, Ferguson discharged her from a mental health hospital into the care of a GP and her family, knowing that Sheila was a user of both cocaine and cannabis and who would assume charge of her children. From Sheila's records and through contact with her parents, Ferguson knew that there was every possibility Sheila would stay at White House Farm, as she had done after a previous stay in hospital. It is widely known that farmers keep guns and in the 1980s those guns were left around the house and yet it still did not occur to Dr Ferguson that Sheila might take her children with her to White House Farm and to their deaths. Notwithstanding this, Ferguson also knew specifically that Sheila was fearful that she would murder her children, yet he approved her release to a tragic but avoidable end.